A campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's OK. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. 26. OK, good. And are you a student, teacher or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? OK, well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's OK. It's $20,000 a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day on average do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot really. I'd say just over an hour all told. Now you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions 5 to 10. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later, after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programmes do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programmes would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news. So I'd like to see programmes about local information, you know, providing a service to the campus community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers, you know, some lectures or relevant programmes. Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new director some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too, you know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now, this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think, well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to. 
as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. Okay, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not, except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. Okay. Can I have your name and address? Of course. I have a card I can give you. Oh, great. And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure. Mmm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a lecture given by a counselor. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I am your counsellor for this year. Today we will visit the facilities available to you on our campus. As students, you should take advantage of everything you have available to you. How many of you like sports? Well, I hope most of you do, because our school has great sports facilities. We have an indoor gym with state-of-the-art equipment. First, I want to tell you about our basketball facilities. There are two basketball courts. Both are full court and open for student use. We offer basketball leagues that all students are invited to join. Just sign up with a team. Usually, there are games on the courts, but during league time, only the teams are allowed to use the courts. The basketball courts are open 24 hours a day. If you want a job, you can be a referee at the games. Next, I want to tell you about the tennis facilities. We have five tennis courts available for student use. The tennis courts are open every day, 8 a.m. until 10 in the evening. You should call ahead to reserve a court because they are very popular and can often be booked weeks in advance. There are rackets and balls available for rent at the front desk of the courts. There is an Olympic-sized swimming pool that is open for students and the general public. There are also showers and locker rooms available. The swimming pool is open every day, 9am until 7 in the evening. There are openings for the position of lifeguards, so if you are looking for a job in the sun, this might be good for you. Now look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 16 to 20. There are also two weight rooms and a gymnastics room. The weight rooms have all the standard equipment available. Please check with the gym to see the open hours because they vary from time to time. The gymnastics room is usually not open for individual users because there are almost always classes held in the room. However, if you are interested, you may sign up for gymnastics classes. Plus, if you like martial arts and boxing, we offer classes for everyone, from beginners to advanced students. Please check the schedule for availability. There is everything available, from Chinese wushu to Brazilian wrestling. I will talk for a brief moment about our library system. Our campus has three libraries available to undergraduate students. One additional graduate library and one faculty library. The libraries are open daily until midnight except for during testing periods 
when the libraries will be open 24 hours. Please look on a map to see where the libraries are located. All students with a valid ID can check out books, with a maximum of 10 books at a time. Books can be checked out for a two-week period and then renewed for one month maximum. After that, there is a $1 fine per week that the book is overdue. I will repeat that. There is a hefty $1 fine per week. So it is a good idea to return books on time. If you lose a book, then you will have to repay the library for it, plus a fine. If you damage a book, most likely you will have to repay the value of the book. So please, enjoy the library facilities, but take care of the school's belongings. The library is also equipped with 200 computers for student use. They are all internet ready and available for use. You must sign up at the library for one hour time slots. You may sign up for up to three consecutive slots at a time. No one can use the computers without first signing in at the library. That is it for now. Thank you for your attention. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself. And this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor. But the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, which put pressure on the baby's neck. After 10 minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within 20 minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. 
Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find a solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctor, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E onto the program to argue his case as a doctor. Until next week, then... Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a conversation about using recorded delivery and registered post. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tom, where are you going? To the post office. I'm going to send some packets to Leeds. Do you know the best way to send them? Well, if your need is for a record of posting and delivery rather than compensation for loss, recorded delivery is particularly suitable for sending documents and papers of little or no monetary value. Well, what can we send for recorded delivery? All kinds of inland postal packets except parcels, airway and railway letters and parcels. The service does not apply to mail for the Irish Republic. I see. How do I post them? You should get a certificate of posting form from the container in the post office and follow the instructions shown on the reverse. The certificate will be your record of posting. Can I send anything in the post? No, you can't. You must not send banknotes, currency notes and some valuable things because there is no special handling in the post. Recorded delivery mail is carried with the ordinary unregistered post and there is no special security treatment. How do we use recorded delivery? Well, when your letter or packet is delivered, it is signed for by the recipient and a record is kept by the post office. The post office does not undertake to deliver recorded delivery or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by completing an advice of delivery form either at the time of posting or later. This form will be signed by a post office official, not by the addressee of the recipient. A fee is payable, which is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Is there any compensation for loss? Well, compensation is limited. Compensation may be paid for loss or damage, but will not be paid for money or any other inadmissible item. If you want a speedy service for articles of value with extra security of handling en route and wish to have compensation in the event of loss or damage, you should use registered post. What can we send if we use registered post? Any first-class letter or packet except airway letter or railway letter. How do we post? I mean, what should we do? Well, you should make sure that the packet is made up in a strong cover and then it is fastened with wax, gum or other adhesive substance. Hand the packet to the post office counter clerk, together with the cost of postage and the registration fee. Do not post it in the posting box. Make sure that the fee paid is adequate to cover the value of the content. The counter clerk will give you a certificate of posting which he has initiated with the date stamped. Is there any special security for the registered post? Yes. All registered mail receives special security treatment. Packing is very important because registration is not in itself a safeguard against damage. The contents of registered packets must be adequately packed. How do we pack then? Do we have to use special envelope? Yes, you have to send the articles in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. These envelopes are already stamped for first-class postage and have the minimum registration fee. What about the compensation? Compensation will not be paid for the following articles, such as banknotes, currency notes, trading stamps, coupons and some valuable things unless they are enclosed in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. I see. How does it deliver? The recipient on delivery signs for your registered mail. The post office does not undertake to deliver registered or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by paying an additional fee and completing an advice of delivery form, either at the time of posting or later. If you require the recipient's signature on the advice of delivery, the form must be handed in at the time of posting, otherwise a post office official will sign the certificate. The advice of delivery fee is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Thank you very much for all this useful information. That is the end of part four.